Clash of the Media Titans, Tucker Carlson tore into late night comedian Jon Stewart on Tuesday while speaking with Lex Friedman about his recent visit and subsequent glowing praise of Moscow. Carlson called the late night talk show a tool of the regime in a sinister way. And Carlson added, quote, we don't have to live like animals. That's kind of what I was saying. Even the Russians under Vladimir freaking Putin can live like this. And no, it's not a feature of dictatorships. That's the most dishonest line by people who, like Jon Stewart, who really are trying to prepare the population for accepting a lot less. During the three-hour-long conversation, Tucker hit everything from Putin to Navalny to the CIA and more. Tucker also hit on political freedom and elections, claiming the 2020 election was 100 percent stolen. He pointed to changes made to how people vote and the censorship of information that challenged COVID and COVID-related policies. Tucker Carlson said he now believes the United States interferes in elections abroad, saying, quote, the hard left was always saying the U.S. was interfering in other countries' elections, and I dismissed that out of hand as stupid and actually a slander against my country. But it turned out, it turned out all to be true. It's been a shock for me in my middle age to understand. Okay, now it's my turn to say it, Robbie. Based Tucker Carlson. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to reality. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not even like a leftist thing. It's just like the factual record of the history of the United States of America. But I, I guess he didn't, I don't know, learn about domino theory in school and what the whole core war was about. So I guess he's on board. Thank you. Welcome. I obviously do not think it's based to uh, do election denialism, especially at this late date in yeah. our country's history. But here we are. Yeah, I mean, with the election stuff, and because when Tucker goes into it, he's saying that well, we, we had this new system for voting because of COVID, and there was, you know, the, the media was running cover for some bad narratives. So and the new system, you just mean like absentee ballot being able to right, vote right. absentee. None of this is is people ought to be careful. This is not the same as saying there was fraud. Now, Trump himself has done this when, like, when confronted by Caitlin Collins, and she's saying you're still saying it was stolen. He brings up like the Hunter Biden laptop story, and I happen to agree that that was mishandled by the media and it was censored, and all these things were done. Doesn't mean the election itself was like unfair, um, but you know, yeah, there weren't. It wasn't mean like briefcases full of ballots, but it was also an allegation. That, that's what was alleged. Trump. That's what they said. That's what was promised, and then there wasn't evidence of that. Right. So they should just downgrade the assumption. Now, if you want to complain about the media coverage and how ever so many Democrats and liberal media pundits acted as if um, the 2016 election was illegitimate because of corrupt the corrupting influence of Russia on social media and all that, I, I think that's on very firm ground. It's just not the same thing as saying the, the stolen election references specific allegations of fraud that have not been proven. Yeah. I mean, I said this on the show when we covered the uh, Tucker interview in the first place, uh, or the Jon Stewart response to it in the first place, but Jon Stewart's it was a choice weird response. to be like, we can't have nice subways because that's the price of freedom was a really odd take that just was not accordant with his stated values and what he seems to be, which is a kind of a social Democrat. Um, Most it, people think we could have some level of freedom and some level of nice subways, and that shouldn't that ought not to be impossible. I, we, we put a man on the moon. I don't know. It just doesn't seem beyond the reach of human comprehension. I, absolutely, and it felt very much like, I'm sorry, the kind of arguments that conservatives have historically made about why socialism is going to fail because everyone's going to be the same and has to wear burlap sack as though that's what's going on in any of these social democratic countries that are the model for most politicians like Bernie Sanders, who aren't especially radical. They're just saying... Can we have health care? Right. Uh, can we have social, ser social services? Can the trash pick up in all neighborhoods, not just the rich one? And can we have a subway that's free of rats? Right. Pizza rats, all kinds of rats. So it, it does feel like a kind of reactionary politics that the right used to be more invested in. And to, I hope this isn't a harbinger of a trend here where because of the threat of Trump or people's anxiety on the left, that you start making absurd, self-defeating arguments about how more democratic forms of government shouldn't yield wealth distribution that makes public services and the kinds of government uh, establishments that we interact with on a daily basis better and right. nice and just as nice as anything that affluent people get to engage with. All right. I mean, look at this city, for instance, D.C., is is suffering a an outlier crime problem right now in in all of the country, a, a well recognized and a, a, is, is not really in dispute that we have a lot of problems in this city that are actually contrary to the trends in most other major cities in the country. Something has gone wrong with 
the with uh, policing and investigative services in the in this city in particular. There's a lot of potential reasons for that. I've done a lot of digging. I found out our crime lab got decommissioned, and so it, evidence has to be shipped off somewhere else. So there's this massive backlog. Um, there are, are arguments that there aren't enough police officers currently. That's one argument that's put forth. Um, there's uh, arguments about the the nature of how judges are appointed in for D.C. by the federal government rather than the actual citizens in, in any other jurisdiction in the country. It's they're either being appointed by someone who's elected by those people or by the people themselves. That's not the case here. Um, and there's jurisdictional fights over whether the city, the federal government controls which parts of land. I'm, I'm saying like these, these are problems. They're not even necessarily ideological problems. They're just like they need to be fixed by competent people. And, um, and I, I think a lot of that has gone wrong in, you know, on various issues in this country. And, and that's the kind of thing that, right, that, as you said, right, should not be a center left response to that. It should be like, oh, well, that's just how it is because that's not it, satisfying it, it to anyone. Make any it's not sense. right. Just say, look, if you think that Tucker Carlson is is give, give a softball interview to mm -hmm. Putin, if you think he wasn't sufficiently informed to push back, if you think that he was hurt by the language barrier issue, just say those things. You don't have to be like, nice subways are bad, actually, and the cost of freedom is to have the New York City subway system. It's you know, ridiculous. It's always worth recalling, of course, the long-running feud between Jon Stewart and Tucker Carlson. Sure. One of the big breakout moments for Jon Stewart early in his career was when he was a guest on Crossfire, Tucker Carlson's show on CNN that was a debate show, and Jon Stewart was perceived as having won the appearance by accusing them of hurting America, um, it, by having what he said were very, I think, only surface-deep kind of um, d debates that weren't really substantive or something. I don't actually know if his criticism of the format of the show has aged all that well. I mean, we do a debate show. I don't think there's... D d now, you, you could say their debate show was not good or was not healthy because they were... It was kind of talking points-based or it was just party-based. Uh, actually, Tucker Carlson ended up saying that he also didn't like the format of the show and agreed with some of the criticisms levied there and has taken that to heart as he's gone forth from that. But um, but he, and then he also tried to John Stewart tried to claim that well I'm a comedian I'm not a, I'm not involved in newsmaking so you know don't come to me for for a diagnosis about what's wrong which clearly I mean, he is a comedian he's a funny guy but he is clearly subsequently a news involved person. Well, look, I was just watching the most recent episode I believe of the new John Stewart Daily Show and he had two guests on one of whom I used to work with at the Intercept, Mirtaza Hussein and a Jewish friend of his uh, to kind of do a sort of a debate, but not a debate because the whole model of the conversation was we are able to be friends despite being on different sides of this issue. And, you know, I watched it because um, I was interested to see what Murtaza was going to say, and I really like and respect him a lot. But I did find the, frankly, non-debateness of the conversation to uh, elide the central conflicts that are real and which are driving what's going on in Gaza right now. And I don't personally believe in an overinvestment or a prioritization of civility over being or taking taking a side. John Stewart in the in the course of moderating the discussion was very much but this side believes this and this side believes that and spent, you know, the 20 minutes or so that they were talking about this without ever drilling down on any core truths that had any moral weight behind it like should Palestinians fundamentally have a right to return? Because that has been the sticking point of a lot of these deals that have crumbled over the period of time, where Israel does not want to lose their demographic majority, and therefore are going to continue to back the exclusion on the basis of race and religion of a group of people that have homes with keys that they own in Israel yeah. that they were kicked out of after the Nakba in 1948. So, I mean, long story short, I don't pr agree with uh, prioritizing civility, and I think that maybe crossfire was the way to go. Yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine when people say they're having a debate a debate, or doing a debate show or something, but then they avoid all the subjects on which they actually disagree, right. and you know, it's not really, then they congratulate Congratul themselves for having a civil conversation, yeah. but you're, you're picking the things you agree on. You know, people can accuse us of various things. <laughs> I don't think they can accuse us of doing that. <laughs> Amen, brother.
All right. Well, that does it for us for today. Tomorrow on Rising, Brian and I will be back to totally agree. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> on every single topic, 100% in alignment. Mark my words. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while you're on the go, you know we're available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Bye-bye. Take care.